Good morning, everyone. I am Razia Cooper with Generations Health. Thank you so much for joining us for our program today. Touring the stages of Alzheimer's disease, what to expect during the caregiving voyage presented by Jennifer Fitzpatrick. We are so grateful to have Ingleside Rock Creek and King Farm sponsoring today's program. And in just a moment, I am going to invite them to join us. But first, there are a few things I want to go over with you. Everyone is muted to eliminate any background noise. However, this is an interactive program. So please feel free to ask any question, answer questions, and to comment on the discussion that is taking place. To do so, you can utilize the chat feature. As a reminder, to find the chat, you can scroll over the bottom of your screen and there, will, there you will see a banner that pops up. On the banner, there is a bubble that says chat. When you click on that, the chat feature will launch and will most likely show up on the right-hand side of your screen. When you use the chat, your questions, comments, and answers will only be seen by myself, the presenter, and our sponsor. This is simply for privacy reasons. Again, we encourage you to participate in the conversation by using the chat feature. Jennifer is great at keeping an eye on the chat and to answer any questions you may have. As mentioned, we are so grateful to have our sponsor for today's program. At this time, I would like to invite Kristen Shanks from Ingleside Rock Creek and Kings Farm to join me. Good morning, everyone. This is Kristen. I'm uh, the Director of Sales for Ingleside at Rock Creek. And I wanna thank you for joining us today. Um, what I want to do is just, I'll quickly share my screen. I want to share a little bit with you about our communities. So I hope you can see this presentation here. Sorry. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. So Ingleside at Rock Creek, um, we well, Ingleside is the parent company for three life plan communities. In front of you, you'll see our three life plan communities. We have Ingleside at Rock Creek, which is located in Washington, D.C. Ingleside at Rock Creek was established in 1906. And as the name denotes, we are located off a tributary off of Rock Creek Park. Uh, this community really is an urban oasis. You have Rock Creek as your backyard, and then you are just steps away from the culture and hustle and bustle of Washington, D.C. Our second community is Westminster at Lake Ridge. They are located in the historic river town of Occoquan. I would say uh, this community is our most natural setting. It is located uh, or it is uh, on 62 acres of beautiful grounds, which include walking trails, two fishing ponds, they have a, an indoor greenhouse and they even have beehives on campus. And then our third life plan community is Ingleside at King Farm, which is located in Rockville, Maryland. If you're familiar with King Farm, it is an intergenerational walkable neighborhood, which is within Rockville, Maryland. And Ingleside at King Farm is nestled very nicely within that uh, King Farm community. Um, so what you're going to have is a lot of intergenerational um, families. You're going to have children. There is a daycare right across the street, lots of parks, very walkable to the Safeway, to uh, restaurants. So all three communities are sisters, but in a way they're all very different. Um, and that's the beauty of our, our company is that you'll find one that matches your personality and really what you're looking for. All three of our campuses are life plan communities, which means that we have all levels of care on campus. We have the independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing and rehabilitation on all three campuses. The one thing I wanted to mention uh, as well is that Ingleside at Rock Creek and Ingleside at King Farm have a program called Memory Support Assisted Living. Um, and our residential programs are really catered toward individuals who are living with the early stage of neurocognitive disorders. And our residents receive a person-centered approach 
with individualized therapeutic programming. And our programming is really honored um, or really created to honor our residents' individual choices and to allow them to live a life that makes them feel purposeful. And our memory support is, is extremely important to us. And as a mission, a missioned um, community, meaning that we're a not-for-profit, we thought it was important to have a vision and mission that we could live by for our memory support residences, or residents in the residence. So I did today want to just quickly highlight for you, because I know we're here to talk about, as a caregiver, um, really what to expect um, when you are caring for someone that has dementia. And I thought it was important to, to highlight a program that we have on our campus in our memory support assisted living. We have a, a respite program. And for many of you who are on today's presentation, I'm certain that you're intimately aware of how gratifying it is to be a caregiver, but at the same time, how it can be difficult. Um, and especially for those, not only is it difficult to be a caregiver for a senior who um, cognitively is okay, but having dementia is just an added piece that can make it a little more difficult. And in fact, I actually just read an article that said that some physicians call the caregivers the hidden patients because all that they go through in a day, everything that makes it gratifying at the same time, um, it, it's still a difficult, it's a difficult process, but it's something that you've chosen to do and you wanna do great. But at the same time, taking care of yourself is equally as important. So. A respite stay is gonna be a wonderful option for those who need a temporary rest. So possibly you wanna support yourself with your own self-care. Maybe you have a, you know, a surgery that's going to be scheduled and you need time for yourself. Uh, and you know, at some point it's okay to take a break. You're doing something for yourself. It's something that when you provide great self-care to yourself, you can be a better caregiver to the others that you love. So I want, uh, for those who are interested in visiting or learning more about our community, I want you to know that you have ways to contact us. Of course, you could call us, email, you can even check us out online. All three campuses are open for tours. Uh, but we are still doing virtual tours as well, if that makes you more comfortable. And then of course, we're welcome to, to send any information that you would like to have on, uh, on any of our campuses. Just to um, clarify again, Ingleside at Rock Creek is in Washington, DC. Westminster at Lake Ridge is in Lake Ridge, Virginia. And Ingleside at King Farm is in Rockville, Maryland. So thank you so much for joining us today and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you so much, Kristen. We are about to get started, but first I would like to give a little information about our presenter. Are you stressed out about caregiving for someone who has dementia? Do you want to better understand what your loved one is going through? If you answered yes to either of these questions, you are in the right place. Our presenter today is the author of Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One, and a long-term geriatric instructor at John Hopkins University Certificate on Aging Program. She has also been featured in national media such as CBS, ABC, Forbes, Reader Digest, and Sirius XM. When she's not speaking and writing about healthcare, she can be found trying to resist the drive-through at Chick-fil-A. Please join me in welcoming from Kent Island, Maryland, Jennifer Fitzpatrick, MSW. Well, welcome everybody. And thank you so much to Kristen and the team at Ingleside for putting this program on. We're so happy you're here. And as Razia mentioned, it, this is interactive. If you have comments, if you have questions, we really want you to get everything that you need out of today's program. So don't be shy if you have a comment or a question it's probably likely that somebody else has it. So feel free to write it in the chat section. So let's jump right in. And I'm going to make the assumption that not everybody uh, knows for sure if their loved one has Alzheimer's disease. You might suspect 
Or you might think you're maybe a doctor has told you your loved one has dementia, but we don't know exactly which kind yet. So most of the time, if someone has dementia, it is of the Alzheimer's type, but there are other types of dementia. But that said, if you haven't gotten a diagnosis for your loved one and you're just not sure, just make sure you talk to your doctor and, and you find out and that way, you know what to expect with what's what, with that condition. So what does Alzheimer's disease look like? So a red flag might be short-term memory loss. For a lot of people, that is one of the biggest first presenting issues. And right now, it's kind of an easy example that somebody forgets that there's been lockdowns and that there's been mask mandates and that there's been the, uh, the, the COVID vaccines. And, and if someone actually forgets that that's what's going on in the world right now, that would be a big red flag. Now, forgetting to take your medicine, that happens to all of us. Forgetting, you know, that you said to send a birthday card, that happens to all of us. But major issues, maybe your granddaughter just told you she was pregnant with twins. That would be something, if you didn't remember it the next day, that would be a concern. Personality changes, maybe your loved one, and especially with with Alzheimer's, this definitely happens, but also with frontotemporal dementia, it, it, it happens quite, this is often a prominent feature in the beginning, personality changes. Maybe the person was very gentlemanly and now they're using a lot of bad language, or maybe they had a great sense of humor and now suddenly they don't seem to get the TV shows and the sitcoms that they liked or the jokes that they would normally find funny. Maybe confusion, believing that Obama is still the president or Reagan is still the president. Wearing winter clothes in the summer. Now, this time of year, especially in the D.C. area, it's a weird time of year. We don't know what to put on. Do we wear short sleeves? Do we need a coat? Do we wear long sleeves? Uh, but if it's the middle of summer and you're finding your yourself or your mom putting on a winter coat and bundling up like it's winter, that would be a red flag. That would be some cause for concern. So all of these symptoms are dementia-like symptoms, and it's possible, and this is, again, another reason that we really want to make sure that you get checked out if you have some concerns, is because we need to remember that these are reversible for sometimes and temporary, but today, of course, what we're here to talk about is the irreversible, if you have an irreversible dementia. Mild cognitive impairment, and, and just real briefly, if again, a big reason we want people to get screened is could these symptoms that we just talked about, could it be from a B12 deficiency? Could it be depression can cause those symptoms for older persons, especially, believe it or not, it, maybe not just sadness. But a lot of times cognitive, cognitive function is impacted by depression in the older adult years. It could be delirium because of a urinary tract infection. So again, we wanna make sure that we are dealing with Alzheimer's or another type of irreversible dementia. So mild cognitive impairment is actually considered to be sort of the precursor uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And about 80% of people who have MCI are gonna be diagnosed with uh, or develop the symptoms of Alzheimer's within about 10 years. And if you, anybody's watching the show, This Is Us, the character Rebecca is was diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, not quite Alzheimer's disease. And I tend to look at it as sort of the in-between normal aging and Alzheimer's disease, but there's some issues around memory, language, uh, visual spatial perception, et cetera. Executive function issues, decision-making, inhibition, and, and we talked about that personality changes. Maybe you're losing your temper. Somebody that never lost their temper before, never used bad language. So some other areas of, of executive function that, they, that can be impacted, problem solving. And one big example that, that is a really important one is all of us lose our phones or our keys, unless you're one of the Uber organized people that's on this program today, you probably all had a moment, you, you lost your favorite pen, you lost, you lost something. But problem solving and reasoning would be like, okay, well, where was I the last time I remember having my phone in my hand? Was I in the kitchen? Was I in the yard? Was I in my car? So being able to retrace your steps is a big part of executive function. So again, the most common form of, all, of, of dementia is Alzheimer's. And it is considered to be the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. 
So in Cruising Through Caregiving, in my book, Cruising Through Caregiving, I write about the concept of learning the language of dementia is much like getting around a foreign country. And so the three flags that you're going to see presented here, uh, the first one everybody usually recognizes. Anybody want to write in what you think it is, what the first uh, first one is for, for the flag, if anybody wants to write in? Or the second one? Well, I'm going to start backwards if anybody wants to write in. So the last one is actually Yemen. The middle one is Italy. And the first one is Ireland. And so learning the language of dementia, I believe, is much like getting around a foreign country. And so I want to explain to you a little bit more what do I mean by that. So if you are a caregiver for somebody who has the early stages of Alzheimer's or even another type of dementia, there's going to be some new unfamiliar symptoms. But there are going to be a lot of moments where that person is just like you and I. And so there are a lot of situations where this person, they're going to dress appropriately, they're going to speak appropriately, they're going to be able to follow conversation, but then they're going to have moments where they forget that COVID has been an issue for our country and the world for a year. They might have a moment or a couple of hours in the day where they forget that. So the reason that I liken it, the early stages, which can be two to four years usually, why I say it's early stages are like Ireland is if I put you on a plane to Ireland and you get there, it's going to be different. It's going to be greener. They drink more Guinness. They have an accent, but a lot is going to be familiar. They do speak English. You're going to be able to read the signs. There's not going to be a problem. And so it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment, getting used to listening to the brogue and seeing all that green. But you're going to be familiar a lot of the time in, in being in Ireland, even if you've never researched it or never read about it, or you've never been there before. So in, in this case with, with, uh, with Ireland, that is very similar to what a lot of us experience in the very earliest stages when somebody seems like themselves, but then they have moments where they're not like themselves. So some things that we see happen in the early stages is forgetting words and names. And you may be, and I don't wanna panic anybody because we all have what's called those tip of the tongue moments where the, the word of my favorite movie, oh gosh, it's on the tip of my tongue when Harry met Sally. Or you're trying to remember the name of a street that you want somebody to turn down and you're having a hard time remembering the name of the street. The, oftentimes the person who is struggling in this stage does have a, a, uh, an understanding that something's off. They feel like they're not quite themselves. And we talked a little bit about unable to retrace your steps, which is a big one. And for some people in the early stages, they might go for a walk in their own neighborhood and not be able to find their way back. And so this is, this is challenging, but a lot of people are going to meet this person and never know anything is wrong. And so when I go into senior living communities, I'm in the memory, especially if I'm in the memory area of a community and it is secured, there are times where I'll be standing at the door, you know, ready for someone to let me out. And then someone comes up and that is a resident there. And they sound like me, they look like me, they, I, they're dressed nicely, they have earrings on and necklace and lipstick, and I thought they were a visitor. So especially for people who don't know the person really well, this person can, can spend a lot of time looking, looking what we consider to be normal cognitively. So I liken that to visiting Ireland with no preparation. So in the early stages, if you're in Ireland, get a diagnosis. And one of the most important reasons that I think anyone should get a diagnosis is because I, I think it's so important to rule out any of those reversible possibilities. And, and then if you are dealing with a, a one that's irreversible, like Alzheimer's, like Lewy body, like frontal temporal, like vascular, you're going to be able to work with a doc or a team that's going to be able to help you figure out how long does that person typically live with this condition? And, and what should I be prepared for 
Do I want to join a support group? Do I want to get involved with reading about my loved one's condition? So there's a lot of really good reasons to encourage a diagnosis at this point. And a lot of doctors feel like if they start the person on medicine at this point, that they can do better, that they're going to have less symptoms. In the early stages, we need to always acknowledge that this person is still an adult and they are still going to be able to make a lot of their own decisions. That said, at this point, it's really important to do prep. Do you need to update wills, advanced directives while that person is still cognitively intact? But this person does deserve a certain level of autonomy that we need. And, and, and any, everybody who has Alzheimer's, they're still a grown up. I write a whole chapter about that in Cruising Through Caregiving. The person is a grown up, the person is an adult, but they do, they, they should have a good amount of ability to weigh in on what's going on in their life and what's going on in their care. And a lot of times family caregivers try to just completely take over everything. So we do, we really want to encourage people to be proactive. And mom, if we ever need it to bring in care into the home, is there, is there something in particular that would be important to you? Is there a, 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 if you ever did need uh, to move out of the home, is there anything, what, what qualities or what type of, of uh, issues? Like, for example, in some, some, uh, some people will say, well, I, I want to go to a community where there's lots of yoga, or I want to go to a community where one that I hear a lot from men is while they have nothing against women, they, if they have to be in a community, they want to be around at least some other dudes. <laughs> and it, that's something that a lot of people never really think about. Uh, or it, maybe there's a religious issue that they want to be in a community that, that is very much tied in with their religious beliefs. So these are some things to be thinking about. So we get a question, should early stage people be reading about their condition? It's entirely up to them. I, so here's the thing, everybody's different. Some people, it's gonna be awful for them to read about their condition because there's going, it's gonna make them feel anxious, depressed more so. It's gonna stress them out, it's gonna, it, but for some people it gives them back a sense of control. And what I've seen with some people who read about their condition is it helps them to make decisions about maybe even participating in a clinical trial. Participating in a clinical trial is a way that a lot of people who have dementia, they feel like they're getting some control back because, okay, well, if I can help future generations, maybe my kids or my grandkids to never have to deal with this diagnosis, and maybe that encourages them if they read about the condition. It's very, very, it, it's a variable answer depending on the individual that we're talking about. And I, and I hate to be, I don't want to not give you an answer, but if the person tends toward anxiety, tends towards depression, tends towards worrying, which of course those would be natural reactions to feel tense and, and sad and, and worried about this, but but some people will do better if they feel like they, you know what, I just want to have all the information. Feel free to write in any comments, any questions at all. Thank you for that question. So for this stage, so a lot of dementia experts will say never reality orient someone. If someone believes that today is their birthday and you know that their birthday is not for six months, a lot of dementia experts will say, go with it. Just let them believe it's their birthday. However, I believe that in the early stages, it's more helpful to, 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 to try to help clarify and say, oh, you might say, wait, isn't your birthday in July? And if they say, nope, my birthday is today and it is July, I would say, let it go. But in the early stages, a lot of people appreciate that, that, that you're clarifying and you're helping to clarify them for them. Okay. Okay. That's right. That's right. Joe Biden is the president now. Okay. I understand. Okay. That's right. I remember we had an election. So that's what you really want to be looking at how they react. And we want to be careful about correcting too much, but a lot of times in the early stages, helping clarify can be something that they appreciate. And some people in the early stages, if you have conversations with them, they will tell you, please just don't let me believe that we're still in California if we're in Virginia, you know, remind me. 
That said, you're probably going to get to a point where when you clarify, the person's going to push back and say, nope, we're in California, or nope, Reagan is the president. And at that point, and it, that's usually more in the mid stages, but at that point, I would say pull back. Do not beat them over the head with the truth. So the mid stages I liken in cruising through caregiving very much to visiting Italy with no prep ahead of time. And what do I mean by that? No prep ahead of time. So Italy, so if you go to Italy and you go to a part of the country that's more rural, like you go to the Tuscany area, not a lot of people will speak English. I know a lot of us Americans expect everyone to speak English, even when we're in their place, in their country, but a lot of people in Italy do speak English, but in the more rural areas, not so much. And so say you go and you don't read the Rick Steves books and you don't download on your iPhone the translation app from English to Italian and vice versa. Let's say you don't do any of that. And what you do is you just get on a plane and you go to the country in the Tuscany area of Italy and you find yourself struggling a little bit. You know, so there's going to be a lot that's familiar. You're going to see food that looks familiar. You're going to see pizza. You're going to see bruschetta. And you're going to see cantaloupe I, and tomatoes. I think the best thing, honestly, that I had in Italy was cantaloupe, tomatoes, and wine. That I mean, I, I just think that I know that might sound weird. I don't know if anybody else has been to Italy and had that experience. But those were three things that really stuck out to me. And of course, there was pasta was great and everything. But those were just like the freshest, most wonderful items that I, I experienced. But you're going to see food that's familiar. You're going to see clothing that looks familiar. You're going to see a lot. But if you don't speak the language, you are going to be challenged if you're in that rural section because not a lot of people. So you're going to be dealing with a lot of gesturing and facial expressions and body language. And you're going to find that they that, that you're going to get around, but it's going to be more challenging than if you were in Ireland. It's going to be more challenging. So uh, that language barrier, the ex some of the expressions. So there's going to be some, some, some issues as far as getting around if you really didn't prep to go to the rural area of Italy. And so I liken this to the mid stages of Alzheimer's. If you as a family caregiver have never really prepped or read anything or you're going to be really struggling and that's going to impact your loved one because when we get to the mid stages of Alzheimer's, we see more wandering. Somebody walking outside in the middle of the night in their pajamas thinking that they have to go to work. Delusions and hallucinations and big ones include very paranoid delusions and you're stealing from me and you might be thinking, no, mom, I'm not. In fact, I'm paying for the home care aid to be in your home or mom, I'm contributing to your cost at Ingleside. I'm certainly not stealing from you. You probably don't want to say that because it's probably going to exacerbate the delusion, but people believe that their spouse is cheating on them with no evidence. They believe that their food is being poisoned. There's a lot of uncertainty and, and a lot of of anxiety and terror. So this is a tough one. This is this area, it's you're not going to be able there. Now there are going to be moments much like in Italy with no prep. You're going to like when you go to Italy and the food looks familiar, when you are taking care of somebody with mid-stage Alzheimer's, you're going to say there's going to be moments where he or she is like you, like normal, like you, like you and I, but there are going to be a lot more uh, incidents where they are not. They're gonna have a harder time understanding you and you're gonna have a harder time understanding them. Lots of challenges with activities of daily living. So brushing their teeth, they might forget how to put toothpaste on a toothbrush. But then in the next moment, they're talking to you normally. And then the next day, maybe they believe you're stealing from them. And then a little bit later that day, you're having a quote unquote normal conversation. So visiting Alzheimer's, visiting Italy is a, a metaphor that I use for the mid stages. Some is normal, some really feels not so normal. And if you're, you're going to be very challenged and, and pretty lost if you don't educate yourself about how to manage the mid stages. So the late stages, I uh, utilize Yemen as an example. And Yemen is, if you go there with no prep, you're going to be in big trouble. 
because it is a very undeveloped country. Women do not have the same rights as men. There are a lot of gesturing and body language that might be considered offensive. They speak and write in Arabic. And again, the roads are un undeveloped, many of the roads are undeveloped. So you go to Yemen, it's going to be an extremely jarring experience if you didn't prep. And this is very much like the late stages of Alzheimer's. If you suddenly haven't seen somebody for 10 years and they have late stage Alzheimer's, you're just gonna probably not recognize hardly anything about them. And what kinds of things happen? So pretty much no ability to do activities of daily living. So brushing their hair, getting out of a chair, uh, feeding themselves, they're gonna be very challenged. And mostly they can't do activities of daily living. They're going to be dependent on others to buy their food, to make their food, to probably feed them. They're going to be dependent on others for maybe even getting out of bed, maybe probably going to be incontinent. And the vocabulary is totally diminished. So very few words are still available to that person because of the way that their brain is being compromised. And so inability to use words, so a lot of their a lot of their communication with you and your communication with them is very much going to be um, with facial expressions and hand gestures. And, and this is very challenging with what's going on with people being asked to wear masks because people who have Alzheimer's, especially in the later stages, they are depending on looking at a reassuring look or a smile. So it can be very, very challenging, especially in the late stages. So another example that I want to share with you is I'm going to give you the example of picking up somebody to go out to dinner. And so let's talk about the Ireland, the Italy, and the Yemen. So let's say I go to pick my, my Aunt Sue up to take her out for a nice dinner for her birthday. If I And, and Sue is always dressed really nicely. She's always polite. She she always, you know, dressed to the nines, makeup, hair, she has jewelry on, perfume. And so in the early stages, I might go pick up Aunt Sue for the birthday party or her birthday dinner. And, and I see her and I think, oh, she maybe uh, looks a little bit disheveled. Maybe her, her lipstick's not on quite right. And maybe, maybe she uh, missed a button or something on one of her shirts and I help her out. But maybe a couple of years later, I go to pick up Aunt Sue for her birthday dinner and I get there and her clothes are on, but they look like they're dirty. They look like they came out of a dirty hamper. And she doesn't remember that why I picked her up. Why, why, why are you picking me up? Where are we going? And maybe she's, she's wearing two different earrings. And then in the Yemen stage, in the late stage, Sue, Aunt Sue is probably not going to be able to dress herself at all. And she's probably not going to be able to get to the front door to open it up to go out to dinner. And she might not even be able to, to chew or swallow anymore. So that's a little bit of an, another example about the stages. And so what's so important is for all of us to become, if you're taking care of somebody that you love, to become familiar with, with what to expect and to become familiar with what is normal for that stage. And all of these stages can be a year, they can be two years, they can be five years. People can live with dementias for five years, 10 years, 15, 20, but we wanna be familiar. So not just for your loved one to have the proper care that he or she deserves, but so you maintain your sanity. When you know what to expect and you know what's quote unquote normal or a lot of patients go through this, you're gonna have a less stressful caregiving experience. Feel free to write in with any comments, any questions, any thoughts whatsoever. I'd love to hear from you. And I, we really do want this time that Ingleside has sponsored to be all about you. So anything that you wanna share, anything you wanna ask, we are we, we have the lines open just right into that chat section. So this is my nephew Enzo on our boat. And uh, I, I think it's important to always remember that, you know, Enzo was pointing uh, here. And we oftentimes are treating persons who have dementia like they're a small child. 
we don't want to do that. You always want to remember that that person deserves dignity, that they're an adult, they live the full life. I wrote a whole chapter about that in Cruising Through Caregiving. But much of their language is that of a small child. And it becomes progressively more childlike as the disease progresses. So in Ireland, they're probably going to talk mostly like you and I. When they're in Italy, they're going to be more like a child. And in, in the late stages, they're going to be, if they want something, they're going to be pointing toward it. They're not going to ask for a blanket, might point at a blanket. If they want you to come hug them, they might just put their arms out. They're not going to say, oh, come give me a hug. And so I remember going out to dinner with Enzo when he was around, I think he was about, about two and a half or three here. And uh, he was, you know, still developing some of his language. And if he wanted ketchup, he would just point at it. Or if he wanted to, uh, you know, if he wanted somebody to pick him up, he would put his hands up. And so a lot of our language and our communication is going to be much like a small child, but we want to always remember there is an adult inside there. We don't want to infantilize that person. And it can be hard to remember that because much of their, their ability to communicate is going to be very childlike. So what do we want to do? One, we want to validate. And there's a great book by Naomi File called The Validation Breakthrough. It's, I recommend it. And it talks about being in the moment with that person. And if they believe that it's the 4th of July and it's the middle of winter, that we maybe talk about 4th of July memories. We validate where they are. We validate their experience, their feelings. We want to redirect. If someone is having a tough time, sometimes it can be simply about getting them involved in something else. So maybe the person is wandering and they walk out of the front door. Maybe we redirect, we take them on, uh, put them in a car and we take them to a park and we go out for a walk together. We re or we bring them inside and we put on music that they enjoy. Music that is something that's in their long-term memory that they know all the words to. It can be really, really fascinating to see people who have Alzheimer's disease who can't talk or have very little talking ability left, but that are actually able to sing. It's, it's, it's miraculous, actually. So we, we uh, my loved one is diagnosed with MCI, I was on a regular floor, but due to elopement was put on a memory care floor. How detrimental is that? Can it cause faster decline? That's a great question. So first I wanna just say what elopement is because some people might not know what that word is. I One time I said that to my husband and my husband, I feel like at this point, cause I've been in this field for so many years, I feel like he knows all the language. And I said, oh gosh, yeah, I had a, a there's an organization I'm working with. They had a big elopement issue today. And he says, oh really? Somebody with Alzheimer's went and got married. That's really what he thought. He, without you know, anybody knowing and no. So really it means that they wandered away from the community or wandered away from the house. We call that an elopement for anybody who may, he may not be familiar with that language. So here's the thing is that I don't think it's detrimental. I think it's probably essential if that, if your loved one is, is leaving and that is very risky. It's risky because of weather. It's risky because of traffic. It's risky because of criminals. I mean, it's it's just risky if that if that loved one is leaving. And so, I think it's great that that, that person is in a community. Uh, I know that it can feel really like a letdown that your loved one is moving to another level of care. I I get that. I really do. But I think that it's probably where he or she needs to be. And is it causing a faster cognitive decline? Well, these are the questions I would ask. Is the memory care area, do they have engaging activities? Is the staff trained on how to respond and communicate appropriately with somebody who has dementia? What are you observing? Like, What are you observing that's making you think it could cause a faster decline? I have not seen any evidence of, of that, but I have seen evidence that if they're in an environment where they're, it's more catered towards somebody who has cognitive issues, that they're going to be probably safer 
and they're probably going to be more engaged because typically the programs and the activities and the exercise is more geared towards somebody with cognitive issues. But I know that it can feel like a letdown and, and try not, I think give it a chance and see what you think. But if you have specific concerns, I would please write them in because I'd love to address them if you want to, if you want to do that. So another example is engage in preventive activity. So what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of times, and especially if you're in a private home, what we see people do with their loved one who has dementia is they, the person gets up, they might be have some breakfast, and then they're sitting in a couch or a chair all day, day in, day out. They have the newspaper in front of them, which they can't really read. Maybe they have the TV on all day. And a lot of times it's on 24 hour news, which is very stressful for everybody, not just people with dementia, but even more so I think with people who have dementia. But what do we want? So I once worked with a family and I just, I loved their approach to preventive activity because when somebody's engaged, and this is another reason that a memory care area is often a very good fit for somebody who has dementia because they're doing activities, they're engaging. So I worked with a family once where the they she the the wife the wife and the husband the wife uh, the husband had Alzheimer's and it was probably mid stage and the the wife uh, was his caregiver and she wanted to try to keep him home as long as she could and. She would wake up in the morning, they'd have breakfast, they would maybe watch a little TV. And then by 10.30ish, 11, they would leave the house and they would have something that they wanted to do. Whether they went to Target, whether they had some doctor's appointments, whether they went and visited a friend's house, whether they went out for coffee or maybe they went out for an early lunch maybe did some errands, maybe went to the park and walked. They went out and actually did something. They got some exercise. They got some, some social engagement of some sort. And then they would be back mid-afternoon and they would maybe take a little rest, have some dinner, and then go for a walk after dinner and then settle in and watch a little TV. And to me, that is beautiful because what was not happening with her husband is he was not engaged in boredom and apathy. And I think we start to see a lot of behavioral issues when someone's bored. And so this is why going to adult day or going to a memory care area of a senior living community can be so good for cognitive stimulation because there's a music activity, there's an exercise activity, there's an art activity, there's a gardening activity. And a lot of times in the private home, families work, families have kids, they have a lot of other responsibilities going on. And so this can be a real benefit of, of a memory care area. So engaging, and listen, if you're home and you're saying, you know, how do I do that? It doesn't have to be complicated. It might be while you're cooking dinner, you put on music that your husband really likes that's in his long-term memory. Maybe he loves the Supremes. Maybe he loves Frank Sinatra. Maybe he loves holiday music. And I know it's not the holidays, but if he likes it, put it on because it's something to stimulate his brain. And if it's it almost always is, is music going to trump watching TV? Unless it's an old movie, it's in their long-term memory, but going, going for a regular walk, maybe doing yoga, you know, there's free YouTube videos. It's something that your loved one probably can still do, even if they're in the mid stages. But if your loved one, it's the kiss of, it's the kiss of, of of death you know not literally but the, it, to me it's it's the kiss of decline if the person is not doing anything all day so besides elopement are there other actions or milestones that signal it's time to move to a memory care setting yeah there are so for one any kind of dangerous behavior that you exhibit so if you see your loved one thinks that they're gonna cook dinner and they leave boiling water on the stove and they forget about it and they do this every day, that's definitely something to be concerned about. That, you know, if you see that sort of problem. The other, the other issue that I see a lot is when you are losing your patience a lot. You or other people on your caregiving crew, your family, your friends, 
that you that, that you just can't stand to hear that same story about the time that they got into that car accident when they were in high school for the 30th time and you feel like you're losing it. A lot of it has to do with the family caregiver. How stressed are you? And I think one of the best ways to do that, and if you actually go to cruisingthroughcaregiving.com, I have free assessments where you can look at how stressed you are and Razia can write that in for us. But if you go there totally free, you can get a, a free chapter, but you also can get all of the uh, assessments that you can use for yourself and your other family members. But I think a lot of it is not just about how your loved one is doing. It, a lot of it is, is you. And are you able to provide care that is patient and compassionate or are you getting burned out? And I'm not saying that to blame you. It is normal to get burned out if you're with that person a lot, especially those of you who are 24 seven. And keep in mind that they're getting bored and exhausted of being around you too. It's not just you're getting impatient with them. They probably will benefit from seeing other people. So elopement, anything dangerous, like leaving the stove on, lighting candles, letting strangers into the house, picking up the phone, giving out their credit card information to somebody that, that calls and other, other issues if you're feeling burnt out. But then the other one, the other big one is apathy and boredom. In that you will, you will, they will benefit from being in a, a memory care setting if they just they're not doing anything all day because they're going to be more stimulated and they're going to be able to use the skills that they do still have. Great questions. And Rosalind saying that her loved one loves Uno card games and that's something that keeps her loved one stimulated. That's that's great. Thank you for sharing that. So what do we not want to do? We do not want to correct. So if, again, if they're in the Ireland, the early stages, some, some clarifying can be good, especially if they're asking you for it, but don't correct and don't get into a power struggle. Don't get into an argument. That is a common mistake that we see happen that no, it's not 4th of July. Yes, it is. No, it's not. And then the next thing, you know, and I had this happen with somebody that I worked with, that the person with dementia, because they're getting so frustrated, they're shaking their hands and 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 look like they're about to become violent. And sometimes people do become uh, violent. People who have never been violent before, because they're so frustrated and they they hit a wall or they they might if they come close to them. So be very cautious about correcting, especially past early stages. You just want to go with their 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 world be in the moment with them you don't want to argue do not you will never win the argument and don't expect what's working today to work forever so maybe your loved one is at home and you're thinking you know what I'm doing all right like that family I talked about that they would go out every day around 10 30 11 and then they had a nice routine where they they engaged in activities but the the point is you always want to have other plans, backup plans for if what's working today is not working. And what do I mean by that? Look at senior living communities now. Uh, interview home care aides that in case you ever choose to go that route or maybe look at adult day centers, maybe look at other people in your, and there's an exercise that you could download on cruisingthroughcaregiving.com of other people in the family that can help you, that can give you a break and ways that people can contribute in your friend and family and faith community network that maybe maybe there's somebody in your network that they're not gonna be able to hang out with your dad while you go to work, but maybe they're gonna drop a meal off once a week, or maybe they're gonna drop off a DoorDash gift card so you can order a meal once a week. So whatever's working today, if you're one of those fortunate people that today you're not in crisis, we wanna keep you out of crisis. Just know that, and I call this course correcting, that you wanna be prepared that at some point you might have to change course. So many people think that it is a failure if they can't keep their loved one home forever. Well, guess what? Most people who are taking care of a loved one with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia cannot. Nancy Reagan, probably one of the most famous, first famous Alzheimer's caregiver took care of President Reagan and she was very public about how she would never place him outside the home. Well, guess what? 
she had resources that I know you and I don't have. And even if you have tons of money, you didn't have the secret service at your house. And I'm guessing that if President Reagan ever wandered, that's who stopped him from leaving the house. So know that it's, it's almost superhuman to be able to keep somebody at home forever, unless you have a ton of paid help and friends and family and neighbors and all kinds of people coming together and making a lot of sacrifices. And sometimes it's just going to be better for that person if they're in a community with others. People who have dementia often tend to really connect in a very profound way with others who have dementia that's different. And we don't completely understand why. So sometimes it's really good for them to be around other people that are going through what they're experiencing. So mid to late, you've got to go where they are. Even if that person seems good at 9 a.m., at 2 p.m., they might not seem like themselves. Be in the moment with them. You are capable of resisting power struggles. Your brain works properly. Your brain works. Our, we are so fortunate, but your loved one's brain doesn't work properly. So you've got to be the one to resist that power struggle. Two dudes watching football. So I write a lot about this, this idea. So again, I'm going to, um, sometimes people will say, no, not all dudes, not all women. Okay. When two women get together, a lot of times they talk and that's the way that they bond. But a lot of times, and if you're a man and you want to write in, or if you're a woman, you want to write in, feel free. But a lot of times two men, when they bond or they get together, they don't necessarily need to talk. And I want to share with you the example of my husband and his friend, Bill. So my my husband's friend, Bill, had recently broken up with his girlfriend. And I said to, I said to my husband, uh, if they went out and they watched a football game and he came back and I said, hey, so how's, how's Bill doing with the breakup? And he says, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you were just with him for five hours. Like, what did he say? Is he doing okay? What happened? He says, we didn't discuss it at all. I said, well, what were you doing? He's like watching the game, drinking beer. And it was dumbfounding to me. And what my point is, and I'm not saying that all guys are like that. And I'm not saying all girls need, all ladies need to connect via verbally. However, we do see this idea of two guys, a lot of times can just play golf. They can just watch a movie. They can just go to a concert. They don't necessarily have to get into a deep conversation. I recommend that whatever your gender is and whatever your loved one's gender is, Try to think as the disease progresses, two dudes watching football, what can you do together? Don't expect deep conversations like you used to have. Maybe that you and your spouse always confided in each other. Or you, your mom was always like the best advice giver. She's probably not going to be able to do that as the disease progresses. But what can you do? Can you do her nails? Spend time together. Can you take a walk? Can you listen to music? Can you watch an old movie together? Can you get out in the garden together? Can, what, can you go out for a boat ride together? What can you do that just is an activity? Maybe you're both gonna use those adult coloring books and color. Maybe she can help a little bit in the kitchen and don't expect in-depth conversation. And especially if you ask questions like, how are you feeling? What did you do today? What did you eat? Those questions, oftentimes, the person's not going to be able to answer in a way that's going to be satisfying to you. So try to think about the two dudes watching football as a way to connect with your loved one. So some resources that obviously you have Ingleside and you're connected with them, which is wonderful because they have lots of great information for you in programs like this. But your local area agency on aging, if you go to n4a.org, and I'm going to ask Razi to put that in the chat section to find services from your local area agency on aging, alz.org, the Alzheimer's Association. If your loved one has any type of dementia, they provide support groups, they provide educational programs, they have all sorts of, they have an 800 number that you can call anytime, 800-272-3900 that it's open 24 hours a day. You can talk to somebody about what's going on with your loved one. LBDA.org, if your loved one has Lewy body dementia, LBDA.org. If your loved one has frontal temporal dementia, the AFTD.org. 
we are HFC. This is, I'm on the care advisory board for this nonprofit. And this is led by Seth Rogen, the actor, and his, his wife, who's an actor and a writer, Lauren Miller Rogen. And they provide care grants, respite grants for, for families taking care of a loved one who has dementia. They also su provide support groups and educational programs. So it's a great resource to get in touch with also. And then a few other books. I would love it if you took a look at the Cruising Through Caregiving. Uh, it's in available in most libraries. But these are a couple of other books that I think are really, really terrific that can be helpful to you. The 36 Hour Day by Mason Ravens. A lot of people call that the Bible of dementia care. I I've already mentioned the validation breakthrough. Where the Light Gets In by Kimberly Williams Paisley. I really like, it's a great example of a daughter, a daughter's experience with a parent. And then, especially when it comes to, for spouses in particular, I really like doctors, Dr. Root's Guide to the Alzheimer's Caregiver. So thank you all so very much. If you wanna to go to Cruising Through Caregiving for the chapter, free chapter and the worksheets, we uh, will we will send them out to you. Uh, thank you. And just know wherever you are today, that you have the power to make your caregiving experience a little bit less stressful. What small course correction might you need to do? And if Things are great today, wonderful, but know that at some point it's okay to course correct. Thank you all so very much. And we're gonna turn it back over to Kristen at Ingleside and then Razia will wrap us up. Thanks and have a wonderful weekend. So hello everyone, uh, this is Kristen from Ingleside. Um, I just wanted to give a final goodbye. Thank you for attending today's event. And as I mentioned, um, our communities are open for tours. We'd love to have you come by um, and show you around. And as I mentioned before, we're also doing virtual tours if you're more comfortable with that as well. Um, and I can give you my direct phone number if you have any questions too. Uh, it's 202 five, nine, six, three, one, two, one. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful Friday. The weather looks beautiful outside and I hope you have a wonderful weekend as well. Take care. Thank you so much, Ingleside, Rock Creek and King Farms for sponsoring today's program. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoy your weekend, stay well and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.